Amazon is in so many different places and ever more, and we thought we'd start with a Kindle. Uh, and, you know, it, it's kind of such a perfect example of innovation. And I wondered if you could just give us a very quick how the Kindle came about, really. Well, I think maybe uh, you can see the Kindle as, a, as an example of how innovation happens within Amazon. So there's, there's two different types of innovation. So first, the company is set up by itself. It's very small teams that all have the target to be innovative to continuously innovate. So those are things that are happening under the covers all the time. We have a great A-B testing scheme where actually engineers and all the teams themselves can, can innovate continuously. And next to that, you have the, um, the, the longer term innovations, uh, the ones that uh, require significant capital investments that have to go over a longer period of time. And so most of those uh, get the more senior team involved who continue to focus on what are the core values of the company and is this, is this sort of innovation aligned with where we so want did, to be. Did Jeff just wake up one morning and say, I want this white thing that I can hold in my hand and read the newspaper? Or? Well, knowing Jeff, that is very likely, yes. Very likely? Really? <laughs> I mean, is, is Jeff really the father of the Kindle? Um, um, you know, it, it's hard to always point to one single person, but you know, Jeff always plays a very important role, uh, especially in, in keeping long-term focus of and, the company. And, I mean, the, so the con how, how would the conversation go? I mean, we want to have a, a book reader, or was it a broader conversation? No, no we I, have think, a media I think most reader? of these most of these conversations happen about what is really important to our customers, and a large segment of our customers is um, are, are, are people that read okay. books. Okay. And so think about what can you really do for things that don't change. You know, often we talk about innovation, about new things. What are the things that are going to change? But in e-commerce, it's often very important to think about the things that don't change and then innovate okay. on those. So what is important for, for customers is, you know, in e-commerce is often, you know, okay. low pricing, uh, selection, uh, convenience, how fast can we get the products to you? Those things don't change because 10 years from now, nobody's going to say, oh, I love Amazon, I wish they were a bit more expensive. Yeah, and so for us, it's important to build on those things that are really important for our customers to build flywheels and to continue to insert energy in those flywheels such that over those dimensions that really matter for your customers, yeah, whether it's pricing or selection or uh, convenience or fast shipping, that we can really continue to drive innovation there. Now, your friends down at Apple with the iPhone have built a platform, both a software platform and a hardware platform that has been incredibly successful, made tons of money. Do you guys anticipate trying to keep the Kindle hardware and software as closely tied as the iPhone has been, or do you see a more open model? Well, it's hard to predict how things will, will evolve, but we recently uh, uh, announced that we've uh, released an SDK for uh, developers to right. start building on the Kindle platform, uh, looking how to innovate on the book. So remember, one of the premises of the Kindle was, on one hand, you know, get all the world's book in all languages in 60 seconds to any customer. Right. So that was one of the premises. The other thing is that we also want to innovate on the concept of the book. So you can imagine books or the way that books are displayed to become active. Uh, Dave Siffrey here with Offbeat Guides, I challenge him to uh, you know, start building active books so that on your Kindle, you can have any off -book guide, off, off, Offbeat Guide book and it automatically adjusts to where you are in the world. Are there other, I mean, the Kindle, Kindle books can now be downloaded into other hardware, correct? Absolutely, and so it's, uh, whether it's PC or Mac version is coming soon on the iPhone, on the Blackberry, anywhere you can read your eBooks. So the, the platform as, you know, distributing eBooks is separate basically from the Kindle format itself. Let's just but the best, the best experience is still on the Kindle, of course. Let's switch, um, you're, you're probably best known as a cloud computing advocate these days. Um, and it seems like we're in a, a, a real surge of whether it's streaming music, well, books for starters coming down from the cloud, but actually a better example would be music, streaming video. Are we moving toward a world in which ownership of specific digital files, forgetting about ownership of physical things, let's just talk about ownership of physical, of, of digital files is becoming antique? You're selling books, but we're, you're streaming movies, you're streaming music. Are well, we that's, that's equivalent to renting. Uh, 
But yeah, I think you know, ownership is, you know, still if I buy my, uh, my, buy my book, it's, right. I've bought the book, you know, there's an ownership thing there. Right. Um, but if there is, uh, in terms of streaming, um, I, I think it's still it's the customer experience that matters there more than who actually owns the bits at that moment. Yeah, but I mean, is it, what I'm thinking, is, is there a kind of consumer mind shift going on whereby the notion of stacking up 10,000 MP3s on a hard drive is less relevant than the ability to stream oh. anything you want whenever you want it. Absolutely. If you look at, um, uh, there's a section of Amazon that's called Your Media Library that basically holds all the, uh, for example, all the movies that you right. bought on, 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 on Amazon and whether those are actually on your PC or they're still at Amazon and you can switch those back and forth. The same goes for books on your Kindle. They're not necessarily all on your Kindle. You can leave them at Amazon and download them again if you need them. And so, you know, so, the location of these So you're talking about there. a kind of a hybrid... There's, there's, uh, customers should be able to choose for, for what, in what form they want to have the content come to them. And I think that's not just Amazon. I think, uh, I think if you look at Netflix, for example, right. who has hybrid models as well, they ship DVDs, but at the same time also stream movies from the Amazon platform, by the way. Uh, uh, ten years from now, do you think people will still be buying MP3s? Or, well, the, or the equivalent. It's hard to predict the future, but you know, music, as, as Owen just also explained, plays, plays a Im very important role in our life. No, I didn't, I, and, and I think you know, we have, will have tens of different devices on which we carry this, uh, this, this music. Some of them will be offline, some will be online. And so, yes, I will always want to carry uh, a certain amount of music with me. But you can already, I mean, Spotify, for instance, lets you do that in a streaming Absolutely. model. Absolutely, but I think, you know, music distribution, there's so much going on. If you look okay. at uh, another uh, uh, Amazon Web Services company here in, uh, in Berlin, SoundCloud, they are completely re revolutionizing the way that actually music comes from the producers, from the artists, right. and is being distributed, it's either shared among other artists or goes from artists to distribution platforms such as MySpace and, 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 and others. So you see the whole, uh, the whole chain, the whole production chain of music changing. Well, yeah, that, there's a good, I mean, Amazon Web Services, for you, for those of you who don't really, you know, is a, a utility, you, well, you describe it. Okay, so basically it's, it's infrastructure as a service. All the pieces that normally make up your data center, servers, network, all these kind of things, we all abstract it away from you, and we do it on an on-demand and a pay-as-you-go model, meaning that you only pay for those services that you use on a per-hour basis or on a per-gigabyte basis. Now, what that does is to give anybody with a credit card in effect, access to complete global web infrastructure. Absolutely. If you need to scale right. from, from five okay. servers up to 10,000 so here, servers. So here's my question. Overnight. That gives you guys a pretty interesting window into what people, you know, trendy, fast-moving startups are doing. What can you tell us about the patterns that you're seeing in development on the Amazon Web Services platform? So, so I think there's, there's, first of all, there's a whole range. Yeah? So there's uh, startups on, on one side, but uh, there's an enormous amount of enterprise use at the same time. The startups um, are typically a lot of the media startups or? Well, no, I think, I think in general, I think these days, uh, you know, in the earlier days of the web services, a VC may be annoyed that he couldn't actually spend that much money on you because, he, because these companies were going with web services instead of buying their own hardware. These days, the first question a VC will ask you is, why are you not running on Amazon Web Services? Because the value proposition is too good. You know, if you need to grow, you need, you, you'll, you'll spend more. So yes, most of the startups these days will run on web services. And whether that's a search company or whether that is a uh, folks doing media stuff or anything. Uh, and at the other side, if you look at uh, I mean, seven of the ten top Facebook games run on the Amazon Web Services platform. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and we're talking here about hundreds of millions of, of users a month. Yeah, and anyone that would develop these days, develops anything for any of the social media platforms, um, is very wise to make sure that they are prepared for success. Because I think that's, that's one of the key things there. Um, you know, a small company like Animoto that launches a Facebook and that goes from 550 servers to 3,500 servers in two days, just right. because, you know, they become popular instantly. And if they wouldn't have had the, uh, the capacity for that, they would have been dead in the water as a company. Um, now, one of the obvious aspects of cloud computing is that it implies continuous radical drops in the cost of everything involved, processing, storage, 
bandwidth all gets lots cheaper and will continue to do so. Absolutely. What do you think are the implications of that? Uh, well, I think it has, a, in my eyes, a, a democratization of business effect, meaning that you know, for um, no longer access to resources is an obstacle for anyone to start a business on, online. And um, whether that is for young businesses or for a traditional one, if you look at how media companies are changing, media is struggling and is looking for different new avenues to either revenue, make, get new revenue out of the content or have radical new ideas to go about. Um, so a cloud environment gives them the opportunity to experiment um, at very low cost. If they become successful, they are immediately prepared, but if not, then they can just basically throw away and start again. Um, I, one of the things, I, I, you, you guys made an announcement that basically anybody who's got a book or something resembling a book that they'd like to put up on Amazon can now, including Werner's own <laughs> doctoral thesis and various other, it doesn't even need an ISBN number. You, in effect, you've made YouTube for books. Uh, Am I wrong? Except you can make some money on it, too. Uh, well, in general, uh, we, we like to believe that you need to be owner of the content of the book before you're allowed to actually sell it. You yeah. have to acknowledge uh, so, ownership. So maybe there's a different model there. Uh, no, so you can go to dtp.amazon.com. Uh, digital text processing .amazon .com, DTP, and actually put up your book, put your price there, and we have a 70 30 revenue share there. But I mean, see, what this is what I meant by the, the reason I brought this up was the declining cost of storage. It's obviously insignificant cost to store, what's, what's a book, a megabyte or something? What's a no, we, often we talk about books in hundreds of kilobytes. Hundreds yeah, of kilobytes. It's, it's, a, it's a very efficient format. So you don't even charge, it's not even worth charging. We, we don't charge customers for the storage, no. So basically anybody with any book anywhere now in any language can find a little bookstore in the sky for it. I, I think uh, it's, it's, yeah. And, you know, and if I type it in, in, if I type the title in, it'll can, search it, it'll find yes, it. Yes, absolutely. And I think so. This is not only the power for uh, uh, for customers that want to actually upload a book. I think it's also one of the reasons why third parties came to Amazon to sell on our platform, even though we would all be competing against each right. other. But immediately, you're in front of 100 million customers. Okay. Yeah. And those customers all go coming to our site with a clear idea of that they want to buy something. Okay, another thing Amazon is famous for is security because you guys deal in e-commerce e and you credit cards and all kinds of stuff, so you're way out ahead of the pack on everything having to do with security. I wondered if you had any thoughts about Google's recent experience in China from a technical point of view and, and whether, you know, the to me the, the, the interesting question is we now suddenly have very large, important companies dealing in things like communications and e-commerce that are much more exposed than traditional pre-digital counterparts were. Is that something we should all be worried about? Uh, well, I think, you know, first of all, um, this is not an isolated incident. I mean, we've been, Amazon's been in this business for 15 years, and for 15 years, security has been our uh, priority number one. And uh, in looking forward, if we look at where we invest in, then all our investments, whether it's on the cloud side or on the e-commerce side or in the, uh, in, the, in the seller side of our business, investment in security will remain priority number one. In security, there is no finish line. Now, it's not like you have a good enough security. And it's a continuous moving target. Um, and as such, I think we've been exposed for for you know for all 15 years to um, to to all of these security problems, and as you say, you know, this is this is part of uh, doing business online, and you know it has to be your priority number one. Protecting your customers and protecting your business needs to be your first priority there. But it is a little easier for you guys in the sense that you you know while you obviously deal with millions of customers every day, you're not, for instance. Um, Operating home home pages for them, webs. You know, the, your your degree of openness is 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 less. Sure, sure. There's a, there's there's different there, but you know, this uh, you have to deal with vulnerability in browsers. You have okay. to deal with uh, uh, you know, and, and security is always an end-to-end -end question. You know, you have to deal with uh, people using passwords that may be easy to guess. Uh, uh, you know, continuous phishing attempts, uh, and those are just. The, the pure customer-facing things. Um, it, it's funny, you know, we have a, a... Apple is a hardware company that's become a media company. We've got uh, MySpace we just had here, which is a social networking company that's becoming a media company. 
We've got Google, which was an advertising search engine company that's becoming a media company. And we've got Amazon.com, which was an e-commerce company and is now becoming a media company. Is, is there some, what, what's happening here? <laughs> what is this? I, I'm not really sure whether you would want to call us a media company. Uh, from my point of view, we're a technology company. And I think we're, uh, our goal is to be the most customer-centric company in the world. And, um, you know, customers care about media, but customers right. also uh, care about their grill being delivered and the coffee machine. And, um, I mean, we have, uh, we have a, a local business in Seattle that does uh, fresh groceries. Um, mm -hmm. So I think there's, there's next to media, there's many other different areas, I think, where Amazon's expertise is really important. So Amazon continues to just be kind of Walmart. Uh, the, the old, the old, what was the old Walmart of the web was the somebody's headline years and years ago, and that's still true. Um, well, I, I'm not really sure whether that's the right characterization. Uh, I like to believe that you know really continuously focusing on your customers and making sure that you innovate on their behalf is the most important thing. And and you know whether sometimes you do things that seem counterintuitive. Yeah, when we. Uh, when we first invited third parties to come sell on our platform, um, you know, that wasn't, that was kind of, now suddenly we had to compete on our own platform against other mm -hmm. people selling the same product. But we felt that that was better for the customer in the long term. Um, super safe shipping, you know, $25, uh, both above $25 you would get free shipping or Prime. All were innovations that seem quite simple on the outside, but where internally, both on technology side as well as, for example, as how we laid out our fulfillment network, required significant innovation. Okay. Um, how about regulation? I mean, this is another uh, fashionable topic these days. Every, uh, everybody's looking at privacy. Everybody's looking at taxation, bandwidth caps. There's all kinds of interesting things floating around. Do you have any? I mean, you guys are again, you know, in the in, as a global company, you're exposed all over the place to everybody's. Particular things. How do you how do you deal with that? Well, I think first of all, you have you're you're required anyway that you have business to uh, uh, comply to the local laws, and that's okay. what we do. You know, here in Germany, there are certain particular laws around certain content. Do you, do you in, pay sales in tax in Germany? Um, I, I assume do, so. Do you it's collect VAT. them? I mean, do they collect but it? it's different here because here VAT is included in the price. For yes, instance, in, that in, it's separate in, in, in the in US, US. For those who don't know, one of Amazon's great selling points is that sales taxes are collected by the states and therefore Amazon doesn't charge them. So you get everything uh, tax free. It's, that's not really true. There's a number of states in which we do collect sales taxes. The ones taxes. where you have warehouses. Uh, where you have, <laughs> well, there's, there's a number of reasons why. And, and you know, this is. Um, but coming back to the point of regulation. Um, it, it's really important, and this is triggered mainly also by, by many of the advances in cloud, many governments start thinking about how, how this will impact regulation, how, how this will impact privacy, where is data of their customers stored. And for us it's really important at the web services level that we give our customers the tools, our developers the tools to exactly know where they can store their data such that they can comply with local privacy laws. But that, I mean, that, I guess that is one, I mean, the, the web services part, do you ever see that splitting off as a separate business? It's slightly incompatible in some ways with being no, a no, retailer. No, 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 I think this is, first of all, Amazon.com itself is a massive customer of, of the web services business. So, plus that a lot of the technology drive from, from uh, a lot of the technologies come out of the Amazon.com world. Okay. Uh, so I believe there is always be, uh, will probably be a, a strong tie. And, but, but I, you know, I cannot predict what's going to happen in the future, but, but for the moment it seems like uh, there's a good synergy between the two companies. So what else does Jeff have in his head? Um, you know, uh, Jeff is really a great innovator, and, and I think uh, the long-term view, Jeff always has had a long-term view about what it means to be in service of the customer and how to innovate on behalf of the customer. And I think uh, the way that the company has grown in, in, in the years is a uh, testament to, uh, to Jeff's vision about how to run a business long-term with a strong vision. Uh, you know, and, and there's a great quote by, um, by Alan, Cray, Alan Kay, um, you know, perspective is worth 80 IQ points. And I think it's one of the things that Jeff continuously forces us to is to evaluate whether the things that we do at Amazon, whether we continue to do them in the best interest of the customer instead of the best interest of the company. And it turns out that in the long term, the two, the, these two things are the same. But sometimes in the short term, it doesn't look like that. So we have to innovate on behalf of the customer. 
in the long term, we are finished. Okay, thank you.